Today we're talking about a G.I. Joe with a somewhat outdated code name. Today's all about a dial tone. Jack Morelli was born in Eugene, Oregon. His name comes from the Marvel Comics editor on the Order of Battle comic book series named John Morelli. Working code names for Jack included things like Hotline and Squelch. Larry Hammer then told Hasbro that if they called this new comms guy Hotline, then they'd have to change the laser weapons specialist's name from Hotspot to Sci-Fi. From a young age, Jack and his sister Jill were very interested in electronics and communications devices since they were, per one file card, knee-high to a thyrotron, which is a gas-filled electron tube used in radar modulators. In other words, since he was very small. By 10 years old, he'd built his own crystal set, and by 14 was part of the CB radio network, and by 16 was running his own ham radio station. Jack had a job bagging groceries and used his earnings from that day job to buy all of his radio parts and equipment. Jack decided to join the United States Army. However, instead of it being simply a means to further his education, Jack realized that the Army was his end goal. That he was able to translate his radio skills to the battlefield. And through that, he found both satisfaction and purpose. Through the course of this work and with advancing technology, Jack also became an expert in laser technology, transmitting high-intensity laser bursts and bouncing them off of satellites or lasing targets for G.I. Joe air and ground elements to strike. One foul card says, quote, Out in the field, Dial Tone used to be the guy caught in a firefight, huddled in the mud somewhere, screaming at headquarters for reinforcements. Now he is the reinforcement, and the only message this guy sends is duck, end quote. It said that Jack can tune into enemy frequencies, locate the transmitter's location, and then direct rounds on target with incredible accuracy. His Battle Corps foul card says he's like a walking tomahawk missile, able to zero in with pinpoint accuracy and deliver a devastating blow with incredible firepower. He also holds a record for setting up a mobile satellite transmitter in an active war zone in less than three minutes. Jack served in this role for years before volunteering for duty with the G.I. Joe team. In fact, his 2011 foul card says that Black Beret wearing Dial Tone was an Army Ranger qualified SOF operator before joining the Joes. This aligns with the markings on the left sleeve of one of his figures, which is the Trojan horse insignia of the 10th SFG. Second LT Timothy Gannon said that the group saw a similarity between the techniques used in the Trojan horse in the old days and in what we saw as our mission in the new time frame. Surreptitious entry, undercover placement for a while, then coming out and doing your thing. End quote. The insignia was worn on berets in the 50s and then adopted by Airborne as its crest in 1962. In fact, it was a few years after it was adopted that John F. Kennedy approved the Green Beret. Though it's not official, the insignia still remains part of the tent's identity, and the Black Beret has gone to being reserved for a select few to an approved part of ACU dress. So basically, he's a Ranger-qualified Green Beret, blending the best of both worlds. At one point, he'd gotten a request for help from Captain Claymore on a mission in Brazil, which was his first exposure to the elite outfit called G.I. Joe, and is what inspired him to join. Dial Tone came into the G.I. Joe ranks in 1986 as a sort of replacement for Breaker. Dial Tone appeared in a couple of books the same month, in December of 1986, which marked his debut with the team. In A Real American Hero Issue 54, we see Dial Tone cameo at the Fort Wadsworth Chaplain's Assistance Gym, which had been converted to a command center. Dial Tone was monitoring transmissions when he overheard Hawk and Airtight talking about the intel on the terror drone that Cobra was building down in Sierra Gordo. A G.I. Joe team led by Stalker was dropped in country and embedded with local counter revolutionaries to stage a counterattack after Snake Eyes, wearing a flint mask, was captured and put in Dr. Mindmeter's brainwave scanner inside the Terror Drome. Squad leader Stalker was hit and medevaced out, so Dial Tone and Ricondo came in as replacements. And in issue 56, it was Dial Tone who called for fire, fire for effect from mortar team on some Cobra artillery batteries. They managed to take down the Terror Drome, though Cobra escaped with Snake Eyes still their prisoner. Also at the end of 1986, Dial Tone appeared in G.I. Joe's Special Missions Issue 2 as part of the Brazil strike team for the recovery operation focused on the German World War II Condor bomber that had crashed and embedded itself in a glacier in Greenland. In Special Mission 7, Jack was on a team with Chuckles, LJ, and Psychout monitoring the Cobra Consulate building in New York City from a nearby rooftop. Dial Tone used his parabolic microphone to hear inside the building and then radioed to Tunnel Rat and Breaker who were in the sewers beneath the consulate building to take out the main power line. They used gliders to land on the consulate roof and there Dial Tone installed a bugging device inside a circuit tester in order to tap the comms link for Cobra's satellite dish. 
Lady J sold the counter-revolutionaries and Sierra Gordo some OC riot gas instead of C4 explosives, so when they attacked the Cobra building, which is what the Joes used as cover to make their own entry, they ended up deploying gas instead of blowing up the building. And that was the cover Dial Tone, LJ, and Chuckles needed to walk in, gas masks affixed to their face, although their eyes were exposed, plant the bug, bug planted, special mission, success. In Special Missions 11, Dial Tone was with Chuckles, Lady J, Scarlet Jinx, and Lowlight in Frankfurt, Germany, monitoring a hostage situation outside of PX. They got word over Dial Tone's comms that a plane was hijacked at the airport. The group's escape route, so some Joes jumped in off strikers and headed toward the tarmac while Dial Tone and Lowlight stayed with Chuckles outside the PX to watch Scarlet, LJ, and Jinx, who were now dressed as nurses, try to trick the hostage takers. The ladies themselves, though, were taken hostage and loaded into the back of an armor truck, all while a spotter on Overwatch was watching and relaying their position and directional data back to the criminals. The Joes chased the armored transport with a streetcar through the streets of Frankfurt, and it seemed dire, but they were able to take them all down, that spotter included. For the assault on Cobra Island during the first Cobra Civil War between Cobra Commander and Serpentor's factions, Dialtone was assigned to the recon team, along with Tunnel Rat, Spirit, Sneak Peek, and Gung Ho. They inserted by air under cover of night with a stolen Cobra Mamba, and they were dropped into the jungle's underbrush on the perimeter of the island's airfield. Recon team leader Flint used Dial Tone's comms to coordinate with Hawk, who was parked offshore with the USS flag. And as they spied on the airfield's operations, word came over the wire that they had open sanction and had to take the tower at all costs to control it so that the Joe transport planes could land and offload troops and equipment. They ended up meeting up with Captain Min, who showed them a storm drain that would let them covertly make entry into the airfield's perimeter. And it worked! They got into the tower through a trapdoor. From their post in the tower, they had a full view and front row seat of the battlefield. But then Destro's forces came in from the beach. Destro claimed the tower as his headquarters, forcing the recon team to evade and escape back down through the tunnels. But they weren't out of the hot zone just yet because the tunnels were now filling up with rainwater. Eventually, they made it through rats, dumped slop, and out a sluice tunnel to the surface, now deserted as Destro's troops had moved on. This as the conflict drew to a close. The recon team linked up with another Joe team at the beach, just as Lady J and Zorana were fighting each other. In issue 79, Dial Tone was back underground and back to monitoring the Cobra Consulate building, this time in a sub-level of a comic book and newsstand across the street from the consulate, run by a veteran that they called Sarge. Later, when the Baroness called Fort Wildworth to narc on Cobra, Dial Tone intercepted the call and notified Hawk. They then jumped in lift tickets Tomahawk and flew to where they were able to rescue Clutch and Rock and Roll from Cobra. Later, when the Joes were deployed to the Middle East, the mission where many were killed in action, Dial Tone, back at the pit in Utah, had the unfortunate task of informing Hawk that everything was foobar. Dial Tone had to tell the team to hold out that help was on the way, even as a nasty saw viper was hunting them down. Hawk then ordered a full invasion of benzene. Dial Tone got the green light from DOD and the team rolled out. Once in Benzene, Dial Tone was in the command tent along with Hawk, Lady J, and the Emir of Benzene himself. Later, when Cobra attacked the pit, Duke had Dial Tone secure and locked down all comms and run phone cable wire between all the staging areas to prep for the incoming assault force. And then later, Dial Tone was out of White Sands in a command bunker with Psych Out in mainframe for a railgun test, which inevitably found Cobra interfering once more. And then he was out on an op when Cobra moved in on the town of Millville. Dialton made the cover of G.I. Joe European Missions Issue 5. He went out on a rescue and recovery operation after a B-2 bomber went down south of Indonesia. And then he joined Action Force for a mission to Lombardy, Italy, and then headed to the Arabian Gulf to help Action Force take back an oil terminal from Cobra. And then, in 2011, back in the main series, after Larry Hammer returned for the IDW publishing run, Dial Tone reappeared with issue 167. He was in the command center monitoring comms for the Arctic mission. A few issues later, Dial Tone was in a C-130 Hercules with a team heading towards Sierra Gordo after Bob Graves, aka Grunt, was taken hostage. For that mission, Dial Tone was assigned to Flint's Alpha Team. Alpha Team haloed into the jungle near the Rio Lindo airport. Dial Tone was coordinating his team's movement with the Alpha 1 team and Alpha Actual. They decided to assault the Terradrome, so Flint had Rocky and Roadblock set up in the tree line with intersecting fields of fire to cover the assault, and also assigned Zap and Dial Tone to provide them cover and security. But before they could, they were captured and they were also taken into the Terradrome. Terror is still thinking they had the upper hand. 
The team managed to shoot their way out and escape, though Roadblock was shot and severely wounded. Dialtone and the team then made it back to the pit, just in time to run Cobra off, with Dialtone manning the turret of an Ostriker. Later, he was back at the pit's command center monitoring the mission that Bombstrike and her team were on at Silent Castle. And then, many issues later, Dialtone was in the command center at the pit as the team spun up a rescue response when Sean Collins was captured by Cobra's Laura 343 and brought to Springfield, taking him the original Snake Eyes. For the untold tale on issue 279, Dial Tone cameoed on the flight deck of the USS Flag at the end of the tale. A female Dial Tone appeared in the pre hama IDW continuity, and a female Dial Tone also appeared in 2009's G.I. Joe Resolute, as well as that year's G.I. Joe Rise of Cobra video game, though those versions were different voice actors. Speaking of which, it was Kurt Bonham who voiced Dial Tone for 2020's G.I. Joe Operation Blackout video game. And voiced by Hank Garrett, Dial Tone appeared in a few issues of the G.I. Joe animated series as well as G.I. Joe the movie. He showed up at the start of Season 2 in the Sumbo animated series with the multi-part Arise Serpentor Arise. It was G.I. Joe Yearbook Issue 2 that talked about Season 2 of the series and introed some of the new characters. For Dial Tone, the book says that he's the new comms guy. There's no other way around it. The guy's a nerd. He's hanging on to his Joe status by his fingernails. And with that, it became very clear that Sunbow Dial Tone would be very different than the comic book version of Dial Tone. At the beginning of part one, Dial Tone was playing video games with a mainframe, giving his Cobra a mast for an assault. Dial Tone called out for aid as Cobra attacked, and who responded? Well, it was Sergeant Slaughter. Yes, Sergeant Slaughter showed up because Dial Tone called him. After that attack, which inspired Cobra to make Serpentor, mind you, the Sarge took all the Joes through his boot camp. He then went to the Yucatan to guard Montezuma's tomb from Dreadnoughts and was next at the tomb of Genghis Khan, picking up inbound enemy tangos before helping assault the Terror Drum Command Center in Part 5. He also showed up briefly in the Let's Play Soldier episode when Lifeline reported back about the strange tree sap that they'd found. And the leader was with the Joes when they met up with the local authorities at the base when Cross Country stumbled in with an injured lady. He ended up outside the wire, weapons hot, for the subsequent rescue mission too. In the Cobrathon episode, it was Dial Tone who picked up on Cobra's television broadcast signal. He was able to break through the scrambler and trace the signal to Nevada, allowing the Joes to mount another rescue operation. He actually went on the mission. As they walked through a casino in Las Vegas, a lady came up to Dial Tone and he was scolded and told, I'm surprised in you. Get a date on your own time. They then ended up in a firefight with the Dreadnoughts in the streets outside the hotel where Baroness was staying and the Cobrathon was taking place. But they got inside and were able to rescue Sci-Fi and Lifeline from the deadly Cobrathon. In the Glamour Girls episode, Dial Tone was helping Lowlight's fashion model's sister move, using an Ostriker to help in an unauthorized capacity. The sister's next gig was a Cobra ploy put on by Baroness Zartan and the Dreadnoughts to send subliminal mind control messages through a camera. They were captured and disappeared for three days. When Dialtone took a call from the sister's agent, he patched it to Lowlight, which is how they realized that something was amiss. Dialtone was then part of another rescue mission. In The Spy Who Rooked Me, we find Dialtone called away from desert survival training to mount an armadillo with cross-country Flint and Lady J to transport chemical weapons to secure storage. And that didn't quite go according to plan because they were ambushed by dreadnoughts and captured en route to the Rocky Mountain Chemical Arsenal. Dialtone tried to call in an airstrike from Slipstream, but a dreadnought named Buzzer shot Dialtone's communications rig and it exploded on his back and Dialtone fell down unconscious. They were then rescued by Agent Burke, who stole their load as Dreadnoughts attacked again, and so they had to go after Burke to recover the chemical container. But they all ended up captive again, and it was Burke who rescued them again. They all then teamed up to fight back with Dial Tone and Cross Country, driving a havoc for the counter assault. In an episode called Gray Hairs and Growing Pains, Dial Tone helped Madame Versailles push back the Dreadnoughts from stealing her family's anti aging formula. The team went out following leads with Dial Tone pulling up to the first meeting in a devilfish. He teamed up with Mainframe to interview Brett Tinker at the stadium where Brett was practicing football. They traced the formula to the Ageless Care Spa and ended up captive and transformed into babies by Cobra. And then at the end it was Zorana, who was in love with Mainframe, who helped them out of that situation. In My Brother's Keeper, Dial Tunnel was with Lowlight back in a devilfish, but this time to sneak onto Cobra Island. The episode of My Favorite Things found Dial Tone in the Netherlands with the team and then flying a falcon glider at Castle Dracula. Then in The Most Dangerous Thing in the World, Dial Tone was one of three Joes, along with Lifeline and Shipwreck, that were promoted to Colonel after Dr. Mindmender and Cobra hacked into the DoD computers to edit their files. These were the three Joes that Dr. Mindbender and Serpentor said were most likely to undermine morale and efficiency. In fact, he was later messing with the Havoc's guidance system, already using his rank to do what he wants. 
The subsequent training exercise was a major snafu though, after the rocket started falling on the tanks and injuring some Joes, but Hawk showed up later to set everything right. In the Nightmare Assault episode, Dialton was flying a conquest jet and was killed by a giant flamethrowing cobra, which turned out to be part of Hawk's nightmare. Later, he helped take back an oil rig from the Dreadnoughts while Hawk was still struggling with those visions and nightmares. In another episode, we find Dialton playing a video game with a mainframe that he had designed. The episode Sins of Our Fathers was Dialton's big episode. After a mission in a whale with Cutter and Beachhead and some others, a mission where he didn't waterproof his comms backpack, Dialton was denied re-enlistment and ended up holed up at a seedy hotel by himself. Zorana, in a disguise, went to Dialton's room and hired him for work. So he was now working for Cobra, seemingly a traitor, and right in the middle of a power struggle between Serpentor and Cobra Commander, but he ended up getting his job back with G.I. Joe. It turns out it was all a ploy by Hawk and Flint as a covert op, and in the midst of the operation, Dialtone ended up resurrecting a giant creature which was sent by Cobra Commander to destroy Serpentor. Dialtone also had his own PSA, which was about using good ventilation if you're going to spray paint. And, as I mentioned, he was in G.I. Joe the movie, but really only showed up for a few seconds and ended up saying very little. In 1986, Dialtone's first action figure was released, equipped with a 9mm Parabellum SMG, which looks like a sliding stock HK-53 with a vented forearm, though that takes 5.56 rounds, so maybe HK-33 or MP5. Let me know what you think in the comments that this weapon is. Anyway, he also came with his comms rig backpack. Hasbro sculptor Bill Merkline sculpted the original Dialtone head based on Roger Avery, his art director. Though if you ask me, he looks just like Jack Flack. Dialtone's head was changed up by another sculptor, and it went into production with the updates before Bill was made aware, though it still looks like Avery, but with some notable differences, including the beret. A second Dialtone that same year was released with red pants as part of the Special Mission Brazil set, the Toys R Us that also came with a cassette tape and four other figures. A silvery Sonic Fighters version came out in 1990 and was now much more armed. The grenade launcher, machine gun, laser gun, and his backpack here was electronic and actually made sounds. In 94, another dial tone was released, this time as part of the Battle Corps line. He now donned a blue, green, and yellow uniform so he could match his yellow weapons. In the year 2000, Dialton was released in a two-pack alongside General Tomahawk, which was Clayton Abernathy's new codename for a brief amount of time. In 2002, Dialton got a BJ's Club exclusive figure that came in an A-pack with a slew of other figures. And then in 2003, the same version was put on shelves by Toys R Us as the driver for the Awestriker. 2003 is the same year that another Dialton came out that was included in another multi-pack. This time a 5-pack, also a TRU exclusive, and now Jack had joined Tiger Force and was adorned in the appropriate Tiger Stripe patterns. The dial tone that came out in 09 was the first female dial tone. This was Jack's sister Jill, and the release timing aligned with the ROC and Resolute Media. 2011 dial tone was back to his male self, and this version was part of the Mission Brazil Part 2 set for the G.I. Joe convention in Orlando, Florida that year. There was also a single release figure that came carded or bagged, which was a collector's club exclusive around the same time. And then in 2015, Dial Tone's release found him in another convention exclusive. That time, it was Tiger Force versus the Iron Grenadiers. So to sum up Dial Tone, we turn to a quote from one of his file cards which says, Whether calling for assistance or requesting an airstrike, I always deliver loud and clear. And with that, that's a wrap on this one, my friends. I'm Jesse, this is JLS Comics, and I'll see you soon.